Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Hello, it's a pleasure to introduce Yaroslav Sefcik, um, who is visiting for two days. So you may know that um, there is a disturbing gap between classical compiler theory and concurrency, especially how to correct the compile language memory models to hardware memory models. So there are very few, it is, despite this pretty obvious gap, there are very few people working on this. And Yaroslav is one of the undeterred researchers in this area, almost the only one, I would say. And uh, he is here today to tell us about his research. Hello. So I'll talk about compile optimizations in, in weak memory models, but it will be mostly DRF guarantee, the weak memory model, and a bit of Java. Let me, let me just introduce, introduce the problem by showing you a small example, which, which illustrates the problem quite nicely. So let's, let's have a look at this, this, this simple program. And the question is, if the program prints what it can print. So if you look at it, the only way the, pro the, the program can get here is if it goes through this. So if the only way to get there is to have response ready one. Response ready one is set only here. And the only way to get here is to get request ready one. And that's set here. So actually the only part, you, the only interleaving that leads to printing is take this one, this one, then go here, execute all this, and then execute all this, right? So what data can so what is data at this point? If we go this way, then the last value of data is two. So the only thing that that this program can output is two, if anything. Right? So that's the normal reasoning people would use. Well now what compiler does? Well compiler looks at the program and looks, well, print data. I know what data is, data is one. So just go ahead and replace this data by one. And suddenly, you change the meaning of your program. Suddenly, the program can print one instead of, instead of two. And GCC will happily do it. And we, on GCC, you will, get, you, will get, you will print one. So this is, this is really, really weird, right? <laughs> this is not what you expect. In GCC, if you do some you know, tricks with volatile, like you label some of these variables volatile, even then it will do this? Uh, it depends what you label volatile. So if you, if you label data volatile, that it will not do it. Okay. And if you label response ready and request ready volatile, it doesn't help. It doesn't help. It's funny that GCJ uses the same, the, the same backend. But if you label data volatile, then it, it's OK then. Then, then it's OK. That then it, it, it will that's not. Funny, I would have expected the other way. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, yeah, the other way should be correct. And that's, <laughs> so it's funny that GCJ uses the same backend like the GC com GCC compiler for Java. And by the Java memory model, you should declare this response ready and request ready volatile to, to make it safe. So GCJ doesn't implement the Java memory model and it will give you weird results. Yeah, horrible. So all is weird. So what, what, what we can do about it? So either use only safe optimizations by safe meaning really optimizations that, that don't do this kind of thing. So that preserve the interleaved semantics. Well, the problem with this approach, with the problem with, well, the, then you get well in this well understood reasoning, you reason on interleaved semantics. But the problem is that you cannot reuse existing compile technology because even simple transformations like constant propagations are illegal if you want to preserve interleaved semantics. Or you have to do whole program analysis to make sure that there is no interference. Right? Well, the other approach is relax the semantics and allow the optimizations. So kind of allow these this weird behaviors from the previous slide. And then you get efficient execution, but reasoning about programs might not be so easy. And well, it's actually not our choice, these options. Well, compile writers and hardware designers made the choice for us, and they choose the, choose the second option. So actually, we are stuck with having weird behaviors. So let, let me give you a brief overview of what language specifications say. 
So C, C++, OCaml, and many other languages don't say anything. They just don't, don't say what concurrent program, what, what is the meaning of concurrent programs. So, so it's hard to say what is allowed and what's not. Probably these weird behaviors are allowed. In Java, they, they actually specified a weaker memory model, and, but, but it's still a bit wrong. And I will not talk about it, but I will show you what, what optimizations are legal and illegal in the Java memory model. So Java memory model actually allows you, allows you to, give this, to get these weird behaviors if your program is, has data races, but if, if it's data race free, then you don't get these weird behaviors. But I will talk mo a bit more later about this. So what, what, what processors say? Well, processors also allow weird behaviors. Uh, and the specifications are informal, and we can say now that they are often even wrong. So there is a research, like, lately there has been research from Peter Sewell, and he showed that x86 memory model, like the specification of x86 processor, was wrong and unsound with respect to implementations. PowerPC is unsound with respect to implementations, so it's actually hard to say which processor is right in with respect to its specification. But interleaving can be enforced using special instructions on these, on these processors. Uh, you mean sequential consistency, interleaved semantics, yeah. But for example, on PowerPC, it's not very clear how. So it's still open question whether the specifications somehow say what they should say. Uh, yeah, so on PowerPC, it's not known whether you can actually get sequential consistency even if you put the friends in between every instruction. So it's not known in the specification. In implementation, actually, Peter Stoll and his group has an have, a, have an example where they have a program, they insert memory barriers, like these instructions, all over the place and still don't get interleaved semantics. Really worrying, really worrying. And in like in one, one in 10 million executions, they get weird execution. So ADA, ADA actually guarantees interleaved semantics in the specification for data race free programs. Uh, so that's a bit similar to Java. And the same thing seems to be being adopted in the new version of C++ specification. And .NET also allows non-interleaved executions in like non-sequentially non constant executions in the specification. But the, speci the, the, the specification is so informal, it's really hard to make sense what, what are the guarantees in that model. And in practice, when I, test, when I played with the compiler, it's actually very conservative, it, and it won't optimize almost any memory accesses to shared memory. So now where, where my research actually fits in. So as, as, we, as we saw in the first slide, the, the memory models are, are, are motivated by optimization. So you want to do more optimizations. You, you, want, you want to have more efficient execution while having, still having kind of reasonable memory model or reasonable reasoning about executions. And so in my work, I looked, I looked at some memory models and, and tried to prove that the that they did what they claimed to do. So I tried to prove that several classes of local transformations are legal in, in the weak memory models that I looked at. And I looked at two memory models. One of them was the JAR memory model, and then the other one was the JRF guarantee. Like they, that means sequential consistency for data race free programs. And this talk will be about this second part, although I'll give a brief overview of, of, this, of these results. So let me first say what's the DRF guarantee. So as I said, program is DRF safe. The transformation is DRF safe if it doesn't introduce any behaviors for data race free programs. And here it's spelled out in detail. And what's, what's, what we should take from this spelling out in detail is that safe transformations can reduce behaviors. They, they shouldn't introduce new behaviors, but they can reduce behaviors. So first, let me let me give give an example of the transformations that I that I that I considered. 
So I looked at trace preserving transformation. So let's, let's have a look at this transformation that transforms this big if then else statement into this small. And let me say that R is always register. So that means thread local variable. So that's not shared memory. That's not shared memory. Whereas X is a shared memory location, right? So if you look at this if then else statement, then it, all it does to shared memory, it always writes one, whatever R is. So actually, you should be able to rewrite it to x is equal one, right? Because you don't change the memory traces. You don't change the memory behaviors of the programs. So other transformations I, I consider is this transformation that actually removes a read if the read is not used in, in this command C. So if, it, if R is not free in C, then I should be able to remove this, this read because it, its value is not, it's not used at all, right? And then some redundant operations, redundant operations trans, uh, elimination. So if I have two, two reads from the same location, then I should be able to remove the second read and replace it by a read from a local variable, if I already know what, what it was, right? And then I have read after write, which is this, almost the same thing, except that I know that, X, that I read R1, I write R1 to X. And then I read the X again from memory. So I should, be, I should be able to replace this read with whatever I know that is already in X. I should be able to remove a write if I am writing the same thing as I just read. I should be able to remove an overwritten write. And then I should be able to reorder independent statements. So if, assuming that X and Y are different, I should be able to reorder two reads. I should be able to reorder two writes and read and write. And then Roach model reordering, which is, this is complicated definition, but the basic message behind this is you should be able to move normal memory accesses inside synchronized sections. So either a later, a later memory access across an unlock or earlier memory access across a lock, right? Yes? Question about your data race freedom definition. So the example you showed at the very beginning, uh -huh. was that considered data race free? No, that's not data race free. And then for data race free programs, you shouldn't get these weird behaviors. So what is your We'll get to it, we'll get to it. So now, the overview of the results. And uh, here I am actually assuming that, that, these, that these transformations are performed on adjacent statements only. So in sequential consistency, this is the list of the valid, valid transformations in sequential consistency. This is in the JAR memory model, and this is in the D DRF guarantee. And this question mark means that I don't know. So I have no idea how to prove whether it's legal or not. And I have some strange examples that show that it's not as straightforward as it might seem. So, so, so what, what to take out of this? So the Java memory model actually promised to have checks all over the place. So it should, it should allow all of these, but they don't. And I actually can, and, the, and even the, the compile actually performs all of those. So the comp so Sun's compile of, of Java is not sound with respect to specification. They they do optimizations, and you can actually see behaviors that are disallowed by the Java specification. Uh, I have a question. What does a tick mark mean formally? So tick mark means that I have a proof of this transformation to be legal in that in that memory model. The, the definition of legal means that that it doesn't introduce new behavior. And what is a behavior? Behavior, in my, in my view, is just that. So I took a very simplistic view, and that is your program has only outputs, and the sequence of outputs that it performs is the behavior. So, so, the, so the set would set be the of, final values of uh, shared variables? No, there would be. Spe imagine you have, speci uh, you have print statements in your program, and it's the sequence of the prints that it can, it can produce, or the sequence all possible sequences of prints that it can perform. I see. So it's actually a very tough system. What you say is that so a transformation is independent of the input program. 
So for it to be safe means that there exists no input program, no matter how many prints I put there, in which uh, I'll be able to distinguish uh, the old program from the new program. The prints will always be the same. Is yeah. that, that that's roughly what you proved? One, one, once again, so I proved set of traces. What do you mean formalization? Right? You know. Are you going to present a formal semantic model later? Yeah. Which you do these proofs? Well, I will not do the proofs here. Okay, no, 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 no. I'll, I'll, I'll give wait. the statements and I'll make it more clear. Okay, no, we should wait. Yeah, we yeah. will wait. And I have a pre formalization in theorem prover. But. <laughs> so that was the high level view of, of things. Now, how I actually do it. So I define a trace semantics of programs and I do everything on traces. So, so I, then I define semantic view of these transformations I showed. And so that the syntactic transformations are instances of these semantic transformations. And then prove that the semantic transformations satisfy the DRF guarantee and preserve the Atari's freedom. So you know, your, my view is you have your starting program P1 and you kind of do a series of transformations into some program Pn. And what you really want to prove is that the behaviors of the original program are superset of the behaviors of the final program. And you do it step by step and you prove, so you start with your data race free program and you have to prove that you preserve the data race freedom on the semantics. You have to prove that your syntactic transformations somehow correspond to the semantic transformations and the semantic transformations somehow imply conservativity in behaviors, right? So this is what I have done, all these proofs, and I'll just sketch how to, so uh, what I sketch in this talk is how to define the semantic transformations and somehow high, high level idea how to prove this, this bit and this bit. And I have a question. So you're saying you pre preserve the TRF property as you go along. Yeah. Um, I remember that people made some distinctions sometimes like, C++ memory model, it was said that, you know, after, if you do source to source transformation, yes, you have to prefer, preserve DRF guarantees, but inside the compiler, you're actually allowed to insert, in, you know, create data races if they won't impact the program negatively, like you could introduce an irrelevant read. That's it's actually not, not very clear whether it's legal or not. So I try, yeah, I would love to prove it, uh, uh, but but it, I, have, I have weird examples that show that, that for example, irrelevant reads don't, don't play well with other transformations that are safe in the DIF guarantee. So I, we might get to it at the end of the talk. So it's, yeah, it would be lovely to have this guarantee even if you don't have this invariant and maybe have some weaker invariant than the data is freedom. But I don't know how to do it. I, I tried. <laughs> OK, so now let, let's go technical. So traces are sequences of these operations where this is a read from, from shared memory variable x of value v. This is write of v to x to variable x. This is lock of monitor m, unlock of monitor m, and this is external, external actions. So this will be this, this observable behaviors will be the sequences of these external actions. And this is a start of a thread. This is just technical device. I'll show later how it, on an example, how that works. And so, so X's are really variables or locations, memory locations, and they can be volatile or normal, and I will get later to it. What, what, what are the impl implications of ha having variable volatile or normal? V are values, M are monitors, and E is actually an entry point of a program. And for, for simplicity, I'll just identify it with the thread identifier, and we'll see later how it actually plays. And we'll see later an example that shows how to use it. So what I assume, so in my view, actually, programs are just sets of traces, right? And I have, some, I have some assumptions on these programs. They have to be prefix closed. They have to be properly started. That means that the start action is really start. It has, it has to be first. And properly unlocked, that means that you don't, on each monitor, you don't, have, you, you don't unlock it more, more times than you locked it. So obvious assumptions. All right, so now let, let's see an example how that works. So suppose you have this program where you have two threads. So, and the trace set of this program will be the prefix closure of this thing. And this thing 
actually, so let's look, let's look at the second thread. That's easier. So the second thread is actually only this trace plus all its prefixes, so this and this, right? So because this, this, this second thread just starts and then writes 1 to x. So it has start action of thread 1, write to x of value 1, right? And the first, then the, and this thread actually, what it does, it can start and read something that's not 0 and then output it. It only prints if r is not 0. Or it can start and read 0 and do nothing because the, there is nothing here, OK? So you are, you are uh, giving the trace set under sequential consistency of this program. So now I'm still not saying anything about the memory model or how these traces are actually get interleaved. But yeah, it will be under sequential consistency later. I think those are, those are, those aren't interleaved yet at all. Oh, they're so not interleaved? They are not interleaved because the, the, the first thread is here and the second thread is here. So they are not interleaved yet. So this is just traces of individual threads, really, somehow lumped together into one, on one big heap of traces, uh, okay. right? Uh -huh. And then I'll then I'll kind of interleave them into into interleaving. There is there is some looseness in the definition of of of, the, of this trace set. I mean, in the properties of this trace set. So this is a valid trace set as well, but uh, it's kind of weird because th the Thread, thread zero can start and that can, then it can either write one to x or read zero from, from y, which is weird because you expect that threads should be deterministic first, so they should decide whether they read or write. Or, and if they read, they should, they should be able to read all values, but not just one kind of receptiveness property. So, but I don't need it, so I don't, and, and so I don't assume it. That you have a statically named set of Variables? Yes, locations. These are location so, names. So, so what you're saying down there is that the programs are not deterministic. Yeah, this is not deterministic and not re not receptive. Okay. Oh yeah. yeah. Receptiveness is that that it should it could it, read any value. It could read any value. It doesn't yeah. read this program is doesn't read any value. It does reads only zero from y, but it doesn't read anything else. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but I don't care. And now I actually say what are interleavings. So, we, so I can take these traces from the trace set and interleave them, and then I call it interleaving. So, so interleaving is a, sequ is, is a sequence that pairs a thread identifier with an action. So it's kind of sequence of, of these pairs of thread identifier and actions. And then you, may, you have to make sure, if, I, I say that the interleaving belongs to a trace set if you take a projection for each thread identifier you get a valid trace from the trace set. So then, then, then I say that this interleaving belongs to trace set T, right? Then I say that interleaving is properly locked if it, if, if it has mutual exclusion of locks and sequentially consistent if each read has, has the same value as the most recent write or a default value if there is no most recent write, okay? And if, if an interleaving satisfies all these things, then I call it an execution. And let me give you an example. So this is the same, the same program as before. And now this, is, this, this thing is an interleaving. And why is it an interleaving? Because if I take projection to thread zero, so if I take this action, this action, and this action, it actually belongs to the trace set of this guy. If I take projection to thread one, I get these two, and it belongs also to the trace set of this guy. Then all writes, all reads, see the most recent write, so this, there is only one read, and it has the same value as the most recent write to the same variable. And there are no locks and unlocks, so it's trivially properly locked. All right? And these interleavings are not executions, because this one, this one has a, if you take a projection to thread zero, it doesn't belong to the trace set of, of that guy up, up there, right? And the second one, because it, it's, not, it's not properly started. So I require also that, that the threat identifier must, must correspond to the, to the entry point of the threat, which is not the case here. Okay, so now we, were, now we know what, what executions are. And now definition of data arrays. So data arrays, interleaving has a data arrays if, if there are two adjacent actions 
And these actions are memory accesses to the same non-volatile location. They are from the different threads, and at least one of them is right. All right, so give me a, this, this is an example of, of an interleaving, which has a data race because I have these two adjacent actions. They are on the same location. One of the, at least one of them is right. They are from different threads. So that's kind of what you would expect. Oh, yes? Why do they have to be adjacent? So I kind of want to say that data is, data is a situation where two threads can access the same location at the same time. There could be like thread two, but there could be some other thread in the middle. In, in between, all right. Related action, right? And then it would still be replaced. In my view. Yeah, so, so some people actually know this happens before definition of data race, where actually you say that there are two actions such that they are not related by happens before. And you can show that this definition is equivalent to that one. So if, if there is something in between, you can still move, move these things across it so and make. Where they are yeah. yeah, there will be another interleaving where there are this data is in this sense. Well, I'm kind of curious. Earlier, you never mentioned this business about volatile variables. You only had locks and unlocks. This is the first slide where you started talking no, no, about. No, no, no. There was, there was something. Yeah, you, you have? X are locations, and locations can be volatile or normal. This is the first place where volatile actually appears. So these writes and reads are actually can be volatile or non-volatile. All right. Yeah, so volat so races on volatile variables don't count as races in my in my book, right? So what are behaviors? So behavior is just subsequent of an, behavior of an interleaving is just subsequence of the external actions. Simple. And now we get to the transformation. So how to define these semantic transformations to capture these syntactic things that I showed? So first, let me introduce something I call wildcard reads. And wildcard. So if I have a. So I. I introduce a new type of action, which is a wildcard read. And, that, and so I can have traces. And if there is a wildcard in a trace, then it actually means that this trace is, that, that it stands for all possible values here. So actually, I will, I will say that this, this wildcard trace belongs to a trace set. If for whatever instance of, of these wildcards I, I take, it still belongs to the trace set. All right? So whatever, however I instantiate this, this, this star, it belongs to T. So this kind of allows me to, to specify independence of the value of the value that you read. Well, the, of validity on, on the value that you read. All right. So having given an example, this wildcard trace set will belongs to, to the trace set of this of this program. All right, because it doesn't matter what you read here because I don't just use it here. But but this doesn't belong to, to the trace set of this program. For example, if I take an instance one here, then if I do a write x1, then I read one, then I don't do, they don't do this read. So if I take one here, it doesn't belong to, this, to, to here, right? So this will be useful for the irrelevant reads, the kind of how to, how to specify that I can remove a read. So now, given, given a wild, wildcard trace T, I have these definitions. So, so if, if I am given a wild, wildcard trace T and an index into the trace, then I say that the index is, is eliminable if, if, the, if, if the corresponding action is wildcard read, or if it's, if it's a normal read and the most, recent, the most recent access to the same location is a read with the same value, so that's kind of re removing redundant reads. Then this is for overwritten writes, and this is for redundant writes. And I'll show you an example so that it's more clear what I'm talking about here, because this is difficult to read and understand. So let me give you an example here. So I have this trace, and now the blue actions are eliminable. And why they are eliminable? This one is eliminable because it's a wildcard read, so it's irrelevant read. 
this one is eliminable because it's redundant read because there is a previous write of the same with the same value. The same would the same the same thing would be it would be eliminable even if there was previous read of the same value. And this one is eliminable because it's overwritten. It's overwritten by this write. Right? And kind of the idea is that I should be able to eliminate to remove the, all the eliminable actions. So so I'll say that another trace is an elimination of, of, of a trace if I remove some of the eliminable actions. So for example, this is elimination of this because I just removed all the eliminable actions. All right? So this is elimination of this trace. And now I lift it to the trace set to programs. If, if I have a program such that all traces of the program are eliminations of some trace from the original program, then I say that this, this program is an elimination of this program. And you can actually check that if you take any trace of this guy, it belongs, it, there, is an, there is a trace here that's actually an elimination, that, such that this trace is elimination of this. So, you, so I constructed it so that the, actually this trace belongs to this, this program and the other trace belongs to this program. So now I have kind of nice definition of what elimination, what elimination is. And I show that this, this is safe to do. So now let's shift our attention to reordering. This is a standard table that you'll find on Dougley's cookbook, which shows that which actions are reorderable. And if you want to specify in a trace what is possible to reorder, and I say that action A is reorderable with action B if there is a check mark here in the table. So for example, read is always reorderable with other read. Write is reorderable with other write. But acquire is not re reorderable with write, right? How can a write be reorderable with an acquire? It's write reorderable with acquire. Yeah, yeah. That means that you are moving things inside the synchronized section. So that's kind of this road mode okay, reordering. The idea is that A occurs before B. Yeah. And you can all, so you, if you have, are asking whether it can be moved after. They can, yeah, they, whether I can swap them, kind of. All right. So this table say, says when I can swap A and B. If, if they are in order A and B, whether I can swap them to B, B, A. So having this table in mind, now you can def define what it means on traces. So I want to say that this, so what I would, I would, like, what I would like to see is that I can reorder this thing to this thing because I just swapped these two statements. And I say that it, and I'll, I'll be able to say that this is, this is a reordering of this if there is a function, actually, that doesn't violate this reorderable constant. So whenever it, the function swaps two actions, they have to be reorderable in the original, in the original trace. All right, that's what this says. So this I'm still a little confused about what observable things are. My understanding is that to make something observable, you have to explicitly print it. There's mm -hmm. this notion of external actions. Yes. Now, if I, let's say that I have some random Java program, how will I identify what are the actions that are actually observables or are printing stuff? Do you mean that there will be actually like calls to system.writeline or something? Yeah, or you know, any output, input output thing. So kind of it's simplification really because I didn't consider input at all. But it's all the interaction on interactions of the program with the outside, with the outside world, is observable. But I mean, I don't, I don't understand why this actually. Because imagine that I have a module, right? I implement some concurrent data structure. Uh -huh. right? It's just messing around with some memory, right? When I'm compiling it, I don't. I mean, there is no input output going on inside it. I'm not printing anything out. Yes. So in that case, because I'm not printing anything out, does that mean that? All hell can break loose, and you can start like uh, ordering, reordering yeah, stuff. But, I mean, well, you, you don't see it, so you don't. Behavior, then the compiler could replace it with a skip, right? Yeah, 
I mean, but it's, it it's does like, have observable behavior because you know you call something yeah, and then, then it returns a value. Yeah, but then that caller has an external yeah. observable action, right? And then your program calls and matters. I mean, but I mean, there's this business about separate compilation, right? I think I think you're headed for like a modular way of doing this reasoning, which this is arguing about the entire program as a total thing. Yes, it's not a modular. I see. So it's kind of it works on the whole traces, like of the whole program, not not just you know data structures or something. So you can make it modular, so but I guess what you're saying is that that data structure will eventually be used by some program, right? Yeah. And you know if you use the return value of some call and then you do something with it, then you will figure things out and do the right thing. Yes. Okay. Okay. You can actually make Thank it you. even modular, on, but it's it's more work. So. All right. So this is how I define naive reordering. So naive reordering only reorders reorderable actions. And there is a function that actually shows how to reorder these things. So there's a permutation. All right. And, in, and again, I, I lift it to trace set by, by just saying that trace set is any reordering of another trace set if for any trace of the transform program, there is a trace of the original program such that it's reordering by some reordering function that's legal. So really, what would you what you would expect? Uh, so while this definition seems reasonable for for this for this trace, it's a bit bit tricky to apply it. So suppose so let me give you an example. So suppose that I want to reorder these two things. Uh, they I kind of want to swap these two statements. All right. And so the trace set of this of these two statements is is this, because it has to be prefix closed. So there is the big trace, then the, and then all prefixes. And the trace set of this guy is actually these two, plus the prefix, plus the prefix of the right y, plus the empty prefix. So this, two, this is easy to reorder. I just, I just swap, swap these two. So a kind of the reordering function would be map this to this, and map this to this. And these are reordered elections. Everything is fine. This is easy to reorder as well. There is trivial reordering, empty function. This is not easy to reorder because I, I, I cannot find any, anything here, right? So how to get out of this? Well, notice that actually I can, I can get this, I can get the right from here by removing this irrelevant, this irrelevant read, okay? So I can do irrelevant read elimination first, and this way I will get this right. So kind of, I'll have to do the syntactic reordering in two steps. First I eliminate some irrelevant reads, and then I do the reordering. All right. So actually, what I'll do, I'll just take the trace set and then, then I add this, this right, and this, this t hat is actually elimination of t, and t prime is reordering of t hat. And now I'm done. Now I actually show that this syntactic reordering is actually a composition of elimination plus reordering. Well, uh, but still, I am not without a problem. So there is this reordering. For example, this reordering, if I take this re reordering of two rights, then I suddenly would like to eliminate this guy. But I don't have any rule for that. So I actually introduce an auxiliary elimination that, that allow me to eliminate rights that are kind of at the end of the trace, or almost at the end of the trace. And by almost at the end of the trace, it means that I can remove a right if there is no write, if there is no later write to the same location, or no later read from the same location, and no later synchronization, and no later external actions. So you're improving your traces at the step. So I can. You mean that I'm not taking it from completely from the back? I, I can take this one out and this one leave in still. All right, because there is no later no later access that can actually access X. And there is no later synchronization in here. So we can actually prove that this is fine. And why it's fine is because if, 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 someone, would like to if someone would observe that I removed this guy, he would have to do a data raise. Because there is no later synchronization to actually see, see me removing, removing the right. 
So I have to. So, so what I have done, I have actually introduced a couple more eliminations that allow me to to do all these weird reorderings, like reordering some external actions, reordering with last with releases. Which is a bit ugly, but well, what can I do? Okay, so now the theorem. Now the theorem is that if I have a trace set that's elimination of another trace set, and the original trace set was data is free, then the new trace set is also data is free, and for any execution, and any execution of t prime, there is an execution of t with the same behavior. So, so I don't, I don't introduce new behaviors. And how the proof goes? Well, the plan is quite easy. So you, so we are. So I take the execution of the transform program, decompose it into threads, then do the untransformations kind of, because I know that, oh, I know that every thread was eliminated from some, from some thread of the original program, so I do the unelimination, and then I compose all, all this together. So something like this. So I am given a, a trace of the transform program, I decompose it into threads, I do the so I kind of do the uneliminations on each of these threads, and I compose it together. And the rule is that I cannot change order of synchronization, so the order of synchronization in these has to be the same. And if I am introducing any new synchronization, it has to go to the back. And if you do it this way, you can actually prove that this guy is sequentially consistent. And this is in the heart of the proof, but it's pretty technical to, to, get, to get this right. And I have Isabel proof of, of, of this thing, which is like 10,000 lines of Isabel code. And the same thing for reordering. So I, it's exactly the same, same theorem, except there is reordering instead of elimination. The same proof plan. And there is a caveat, it doesn't work. And it doesn't work for reordering with synchronization. So kind of it works for reordering of memory accesses with each other, but not for reordering locks and memory accesses, this kind of this Roach model reordering. And the reasons are pretty subtle. So I have a, I have a counter example why it doesn't work, and it's not very enlightening why it doesn't work. But I have a fix how to make it work. And so what I need, so I, what I need here is actually that if you have a, let me give you, let me give you an example, that will be the best. So, so my original definition was, I have to have an uh, elimination, the, the reordering function that respects the, that respects the elimination, uh, the, the reordering constraints. So this is the case. And now I impose a new condition that actually says that whenever I, whenever I take the trace of the, of the transform program and cut it somewhere, and restrict the permutation to this prefix, then this, this resulting thing here must be also, must be also in the trace, of, in trace set of the original program. So what I say, so what I require is not only that I have a function that reorders this trace to this trace, but, I, but for whatever restriction, so if I restrict here, this trace must be or in the original program as well, if I restrict the function to the prefix. And this must be there, this trace must be there, and this trace must be there. And the intuition for this is just technical device to make the induction fly somehow. And, but it works, for, it works for the syntactic example I have seen. So what or, was the transformation that has a bug in it? It's really ugly. It's non-receptive. It's some non-receptive trace set that actually... But which is the transformation where you move a right you, inside an acquire, after an acquire? So it's a reordering of, uh, of a, I, I think it was write with volatile write, or something like that. It was it was a normal memory access with, with volatile memory access, had a, had a bug in it, so it wasn't possible with the, with the definition before. So um, you said the count example had the non, was non receptive. Yeah. What if you go, if you add the assumption that all traces are deterministic and receptive? Are things easier? Then I cannot find a counterexample and I cannot find a proof. Ah. And I tried hard. <laughs> and I don't know how to no, prove but it. But what I don't understand is that was there somebody who was saying that it's safe to move 
move a memory access after a write? So it's it's after it's, it's, write it's, safe, it's, it's safe the opposite. It's it's safe to move if you have a volatile write and you have a normal write, it's it should be possible to move the normal write across the volatile write. And and no one said it explicitly, but that's what uh, so the, so some processor memory models do similar, do similar kind of things, not with writes, but with read-write. They, they can, they can reorder, read-write in, in, in this way. So actually, this is, all this Roach model business is just because, because of processors, because they do this kind of reordering. But anyway, this just complicates the proof immensely. But now, now with this fix, it actually works. So with this fix, I, I get, I get this, I get this theorem right, and now, now it works. So in my thesis, actually, I, I do, I do a bit more, bit more work, and I actually show how these syntactic transformations correspond to the semantic transformations. It's, it's not hard, but it's pretty technical. Induction, induction proofs. So I have, I have some syntactic transformations, and I show that they correspond to these semantic transformations. All right. So now the thing with DRF guarantee is that if your program has data races, then it doesn't say anything, right? You don't know anything. But I would still like to prove that if, you, if I do these simple transformations, it somehow, somehow seems obvious that, it, they shouldn't, that there should still be some limit on what they can do. For example, what I want, wouldn't like to, to see is that if I have this kind of program where x and y are zero in the beginning, then this print shouldn't print anything else than zero because there is no other value than zero in this program. So I shouldn't print anything else than zero, right? So this is motivate, one of the motivating examples for the Java memory model. What they wouldn't like to see is this program to output something strange, all right? So now the question is how to prove that, that you don't do anything like this. And, I, and it, it turns out that it's quite simple, actually. So I say that the trace set cannot create value V if there is no trace in the trace set such that it would, contain, it would write V or print V without reading it first. So kind of, it cannot create it if, 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 if you always have to read it first. All right, and it turns out that all the transformations preserve this. And if all the transformations preserve this, then actually it's easy to see that you cannot, if you, if you, print, if you print value, then there must be some origin for it. So, so that's easy. All right, so that was, that was half of what I've done in my thesis. <laughs> The other half was this Java memory model bit. And yeah. So what's missing in there? And what I like to do at some point if, if I have funding and stuff is, uh, so there are other transformations actually that the J JVMs perform. And they sometimes transform synchronization in a simple way. And, and the simple way is, that if you find out that some, some monitor is accessed just from one thread, then all, then all locks and unlocks on, on this monitor can be removed, right? So it's kind of escape analysis based transformations. And this is not explained by my model, although it should be easy. And then I would like to do this irrelevant read introduction, but that's not very easy because there are some weird examples, which I might show if, I, if you are interested. And the bad thing about this DR data is freedom is that it's not compositional. Like it's you, you make one little data race somewhere and you don't know what your program does. That, that's pretty bad. So it would be nice to get some, some, some way to isolate, isolate yourself from data races. So kind of if I do enough volatile accesses or whatever, I should be able to call libraries and still get predictable behavior, even though the libraries do, may, might do weird things, might do data races. So some, some, something compositional would be nice. And then question is whether I, can, whether I can view processors as compilers. So kind of explain processor transformations 
as compiler transformations, which is possible for TSO memory model, which is implemented by the x86, but some more esoteric memory models like Itanium and, and things might be quite hard, actually. When you say be viewed as compilers, do you mean compilers acting on source code, or do you mean compilers acting in the way that you describe it, transformation on trace sets? Transformation on trace sets, yeah. Yeah, and the, the really, what I really don't like about this work is that it, it's kind of safety property proving. So I proved that if your original program didn't launch a, couldn't launch a missile, then the new program does, cannot launch a missile. But if your original program always launches a missile, then I don't say anything about the, about the new program because I only say that yeah, I, can, I don't introduce new behaviors, but I should preserve some behaviors. And that's, I have an idea how to do it, but it's still a work in progress. And the same with proof mechanization. I have proof of elimination in Isabel, but I don't have it. I don't have reordering, and I don't have the syntax semantics correspondence. I have it on, only on paper in the thesis. All right. Yeah, this is for masochist, the counterexample for the naive reordering, the non-receptive counterexample, which is really weird. All right. Yes, we are open for discussion. Go back one slide. So I just wanted to uh, discuss some of these uh, questions. So this business about a composable variant of DRF, mm -hmm. um, there is one other issue apart from the one you mentioned, which is basically dealing with RACI legacy code, right, uh -huh. in libraries. Um, can we somehow isolate whatever races they are doing with the rest of the program, which is perhaps being constructed in a data registry fashion. Um, so another reason why I think this thing is useful is that sometimes uh, you know people introduce um, deliberate races, for example, on performance counters, mm -hmm. and they they don't care because you know it's if it, if it's semantics of the performance counter, you know, just varies a little bit from sequentially consistent, then it doesn't matter to them. Uh, but they are implicitly dependent on this fact that you know the effect, the, the value of the performance counter doesn't flow into the rest of the computation and corrupts it. And right. there is no way to somehow, I, I don't see anybody even you know like formalizing it or somehow reasoning about it that it doesn't corrupt the sequential consistency and DRF guarantees of the rest of the program. And I think it is that this kind of stuff is very important for building a practical system because. Even, I mean, now people are talking about that, you know, you should do runtime checking of data risk freedom and then just throw an exception if there is a data risk. But I think that's just too hard line a stance. There will be some data races always, and we, we have to have a way of isolating the rest of the good computation from, from the DRFs, uh, from, the, from, the, from the racy stuff. Um, so in, I also had a question about the termination business here. Uh -huh. So is here the, what you're doing right now, is it kind of like this that you, so right now you have an upper bound and then you say that, okay, I'm always going to stay within that upper bound as you make transformations. Are you not going to introduce a lower bound also? And then you say that no matter what transformations I do, I stay between those two? Is it so like sure, sure. The plan is a bit different. So what, what, I, what I have done so far here, the thing is that I had this preface closeness and that bit me in many places actually. Mm -hmm. So in the beginning it looked like a very, very good idea, but it's, it doesn't seem to be so good idea. Because for the prefix closeness, I had to do all this business with prefix reordering of prefixes. Kind of if you reorder two statements and you take a prefix, getting, getting the prefix from somewhere was, was really, really weird. So my idea now is, is to work with the complete traces of the program. So the way it goes now, I don't work with prefix closures, but with complete traces. Like you have to go to the end. But there are technical problems like that if you get deadlock, and you actually yeah. still don't have complete traces. And suddenly if you do the untransformations, actions start leaping out from, because you kind of reordered something into synchronized sections, but I, but I want to go into the proof from the transform program to the original program, so now suddenly things start leaping out from synchronized sections. So you suddenly have new actions when you do the untransformations, and it's really hard to reason about those. I'm so also kind of worried about it, right? Even in the sequential setting, hmm. the people, you know, build, compile transformations, do they reason about termination issues? Did they preserve the property that if the original program... So systems people don't care. Like, like I looked, there is a work... Hmm. 
Uh, I know one of the authors, Zehra Sura, and they, they, had, they, had, they had transformations for parallel programs, but for, for interleaved semantics. So there was some whole program static analysis involved to validate your transformations. And their framework was basically, the setup was basically the same as mine. So external actions, and they don't care about termination at all. So the same notion of behaviors and the same notion of conservativity and behaviors. So it seems that people don't do it much. Yeah. It's interesting that you say you want to move away from modern proof exposure because um, we, I was just thinking in the work that we do, we're actually going to go the other way and include proof exposure because I think for the DRF guarantees, I mean, we have trouble with modeling the DRF guarantees without the proof exposure. Mm. But uh, we do have termination, we can model termination. So I actually have the proofs with the complete traces as well on paper, uh, but uh, I don't have Roach model reordering because I just don't know how to do the sleeping things of, of synchronized out from synchronized sections. I don't know how to do it. It seems that it should work, but yeah. And then there is this strange example with the relevant reads, which. So in the DRF, so if, if you are interested, <laughs> and in the DRF guarantee, it's, it's, it's legal. So it wasn't included in my transformations, but it is legal to remove this read. So kind of I re if I do a, a previous read of x, and there is even, the, even if there is lock in between, and I do another read of the, same, of the same x, I can actually remove the read of x and replace it by the local variable. You can prove that this is legal in the DRF guarantee. So compiles that compile for the R guarantee should be able to do it, right? But suddenly, if you combine this with 11 reads, you can suddenly make things leap out, out of synchronized sections. So, so kind of I have this read, read of x, I introduce 11 reads, I suddenly remove it from here, and suddenly I am reading, instead of in syn inside synchronized sections, I am reading outside synchronized sections. So you can make it into complete examples that shows that this this doesn't satisfy the DRF guarantee. If you allow this, if you allow this reordering plus irrelevant read introduction, you don't get DRF guarantee. But each, each of them on its own is legal. So it's not compositional. That's, that's the message from it. And so in your original proof strategy, the way you were setting it up is that you can apply any transformation and it is sound. So, for, so you, your, your proof probably does not work for one of those transformations, right? It doesn't work for the, so the problem is that my invariant, this data is freedom, and irrelevant in introduction can introduce ah, irrelevant. Yes, that's why it doesn't work. Okay, yeah, good. that's why it doesn't work. Good. Have you, have you thought about the problem of looking at source code level transformation and applying this? So if you look at the source code transformation that is given to you, and you want to see if you can justify it in terms of these trace transformations, have you thought about how you could do this like automatically or in, in a methodical way? So the problem is the compositionality. Like introducing L1 read by itself is fine. The problem is when you do something after it. And somehow I try to keep track of the irrelevant reads, like where, where, where they appear in the traces. But they, they get mixed, mi mixed with other actions in horrible ways. And I cannot, cannot do it. Why do people want to introduce irrelevant reads? What is the purpose of it having So it actually, it, it, many compilers do it. And they do it, uh, they do it when they are hoisting reads out of, out of loops. So if you hoist a read out of, out, of, out of a loop and the loop is not executed at all, then you actually introduce a relevant read. Oh. Right? Ah, I see. That's funny. So GCC will do it. GCC will introduce a relevant read. Hard. It's undecidable to check. I mean, you can't really check if yeah, you, you don't know. Yeah, you don't know. Right? Yeah. So Java, JVM doesn't do it, but I think it's more by coincidence than by intent. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm wondering if there is a, there is a, you know, a chance of distinguishing memory models at different levels in the sense that an irrelevant read at the binary machine code level is probably more provably safe than in the source it, it, well, probably yes, because the problem is the, here again. The problem is with the compositionality. If you don't know what comes after, after you introduce your relevant read, it's really hard to reason about it. If you know that you are the last in the chain or somehow yeah, close to yeah. being the last, then maybe you can, you know, you, don't, you are not doing compositional proofs, and then it's easier. Yeah. 
So in hardware level, it, it's, it's possible, but on this compositional level, it's, it's harder. So I have one more question. So in the, in, during your talk, I asked about uh, this business about separate compilation, right? Mm -hmm. So is that is that easy enough to do using your setup? I mean, you know what I'm asking, right? I mean, you have some data structure, right? It is, you know, in perhaps in one module that is compiled separately. And there are no print statements there. Yeah, what do you, what do you, what you can do somehow? Or at least I, I haven't done it, so I would lie if I would say that I've done it. But uh, what, what you could do somehow is to, for example, if you do reordering in your data structures, then you could show that there is a function that does the reordering on your bit of trace. And then, then you, if, if you compose it with other bits of trace, then, uh, then if there are also tr reorderings, then if you do this composition of these functions, then you still get a valid reordering function because it's kind of, it does it by blocks, the reordering. So it kind of reorders one in some block. Maybe it would be best to show it in, in an example. So I, when I have the proof of syntax going from syntax to semantics, I actually do this kind of thing where I am composing two trans kind of two bits of code and their transformations in, in, on these two bits of code separately. So I kind of transform two bits of code separately, but then I do the composition of them. But it's nice, it's nice that these, for example, the reordering functions are composable. So if you have two reordering functions and compose them together, they are, the result is a reordering function. There is some tricky business with eliminations, but I, I think it would be doable. And I certainly do something like that in, in, in the proofs when I go from syntax to semantics, but not in full generality. All right, any more questions? So, yes? Uh, I mean, what is uh, the aim of your reordering? Your, uh, your reordering of your reorder uh, the different uh, 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 trees in different uh, thread into one thread? Uh -huh. I mean, so you cannot, you cannot really do it because there is a start action which, which doesn't allow you to mix, mix things from different threads. So you, kind of, you cannot, if I get the question right, you cannot mix. So it's all, all these transformations are thread local. They, they, they don't mix things from different threads together and they cannot do any whole program thing. Okay. Then your reordering is in the uh, local thread. It's uh, not a... Uh, high and uh, between different threads. No, it cannot do anything with different threads. Okay. Uh, do you think uh, it is possible to? Well, speculatively, it is possible, but I don't know any of any compile or hardware or anything that could do it. So. Yeah. So, so we have our model had models the hardware behavior of doing optimizations across threads. So the, the, exam, the visualization of why that would happen is if you have a non-uniform memory system where some processes are closer together, so say you have two processes that share a cache, then you know you can, you can express the, the forwarding of a store from one of these processes to a load of another one of those processes as a cross-processor optimization. That is, but that, that's still local relative to the larger composition of so I had, so this, yeah. So, so I tried actually to think about hierarchical caches and how they would work with this, this work. And as it is, it doesn't work. But I have some simple <laughs> relaxation somewhere that actually makes it work and makes the proof still fly. So uh, I still, still do it locally, but it's just playing games. Can <laughs> you tell us a little bit about, you said you had the proof formalized. So it's, it's just what, what you saw with this. So I define the traces, I define the trace, trace sets interleaving executions, and then define the eliminations and prove that the eliminations really satisfy the DRF guarantee. So that's what the proof says. And I also have the proof of the correspondence of the data is free definitions. So that 
if you define it in terms of happens before or adjacent actions, it's the same thing. So I have the proof in Isabella as well. All right, thank you for all your questions and your attention. <laughs>